start. So we can start. Okay, so hello everyone. We are here with um, the Digiplot book club. This is cohort three, and we are going to go over chapter eight annotations. Um, it's a little bit of a long chapter because it has so many details, but I hope that we can cover the entire thing today. Um, so let me just go over our next. Okay, so if I look at the list of chapters, so today we have annotations. Next week, Kaya is going to walk us through networks, which is chapter seven. We um, switch this chapter, annotations and networks, because she's at a conference. And then the following week, we have arranging plots, which is also led by Kaya. The following week, which is um, September 11, chapter 10, position, scales, and access. We don't have anyone for that chapter. So if anyone is interested in learning about how to use scales and how to position different axes um, and, and switch axes here and there, then you might be interested in, in cleaning that chapter. And then the following week we have chapter 11, color scales and legends. Ashley is gonna lead that one. And then the following one, which is chapter 12, I will lead that one. Um, so we have covered all the way up to chapter 12, except for 10. If nobody claims it, I can do it. Um, but if anybody is interested, I don't think it's a very long chapter, actually. I think it's a very straightforward and it does have available slides. So if anyone is interested and then after that is October and then we can, you know, see who is interested for those future chapters. But at least the ones that we have all the way up to September, they are taken, which is great. This is actually a very active cohort and I love that, that everybody's like interested in learning about. Digiplot. Okay, so let's begin. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments, please feel free to um, unmute yourself and just jump in and then ask your question. Um, just want to make sure that I have the chat here available. Okay, so the learning objectives for today are um, the following. First, we're going to um, sort of understand and provide some context for the visual uh, elements for um, the, and the overall appearance of plots and access titles. So exactly how to work with captions and subtitles and titles and the access, uh, uh, access titles too. Then we're going to um, see the difference between text labels and, and geom labels and geom text. So how do we map text from data or how do we put text inside the graph or the uh, coordinate space. Then we're going to learn also how to build some custom annotations. So let's say you wanna do, for example, um, a little explanation box with an arrow pointing to a specific point or a specific um, bar. Those are considered custom annotations and we're gonna learn how to um, work with those. And then, to end this chapter, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about direct labeling and faceting and related packages for special issues such as highlighting text boxes, HTML text, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a lot to cover, so let's begin. So to start, this is what we're talking about right now. Like these are the types of annotations that we are going to look uh, for today or the ones that we're gonna learn about. So it's things like arrows or text or lines that are inside the graphical space. Like all of these points, for example, instead of having a point, you have a little box with a number inside or for each one of these um, specific lines, you also have a little label that instead of having a, a legend, you put exactly the name of each one there. It's for aesthetic reasons, 100%. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of what we're gonna walk through today. So I like that this starts with a few examples. 
So let's begin by talking about how to work with the access titles and all the text that can appear around the product. So for that, we go to, so this is all the, uh, the code that we already know about. Like so we start with ggplot and then we uh, put some geom points on top of the uh, graph and then we put um, some other points. I don't know why they did it like that actually. We define the theme and then to work with these labels or to, yeah, with the labels, we use this function called labs which is going to have title, subtitle, X, Y, and caption argument. And that is exactly what's going to control the text that's going to be around your uh, graph. So for example, the title is going to appear here at the top. The subtitle is going to appear below the title. And then the X axis, it's going to have this title. The Y axis is going to have this title over here. And then if you need a caption, that caption is usually, but you can control exactly where, but the caption is usually at the bottom of the plot. So it's this one that it's right here. The aesthetics of each one of these labels are controlled in the theme. So if you want to change, for example, the color of the text for the title inside theme, and this is separated by same, 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 but you can include all of it in one, in just one single theme, right? Um, so for that, you're going to use the argument plot title and then element text. And for that, you can adjust color, um, the position of the text. If you want it bold or not, that's face. You can control the font. You can control, um, what else do we have here? Um, yeah. At the angle also, if you want to change it, the margin uh, around the, the title too. Um, um, yeah, those are the, the ones that you can control with element text. Then you can also control the plot subtitle, which is here where it says source Palmer station. And here you're just controlling with element text again, the um, if you want it justified at the center, that's 0.5. If you want it to the left or to the right, that's going to be zero or one. And then the size also, right? Like the size of the uh, text. Uh, so theme, when you are controlling the size, it's really in millimeters, if I remember correctly. It's not in points. I think it's in millimeters. Okay, but don't quote me on that. I'll check. Uh, and then for each one of the axes, you can have axis title X, or you can have just axis title and then it's gonna control both of your um, X and Y axis. And you can include, which is super cool, you can include some markdown elements just by using the ggtext package and then calling the function element markdown uh, from that package. And then it's going to accept any type of markdown text that you have. So here, for example, if you see, um, oh, actually it doesn't, have it doesn't look like it, but length should be in bold. No, it's not in bold. It's in italics because it's using um, one single asterisk so that Markdown understands it as italic. If you would have used two, for example, you would have understood that as uh, bold. And then you can also, um, especially for um, subtitles or if your title is too long, you can also... Um, divide those lines by using at the end. So let's say here, source Palmer Station Antarctica, and then you want to set, to put the rest of the text in another line, you use um, slash N, and then that's gonna do like a, like a new line. And so all of those things are super useful when you are dealing with text inside, um, inside a graph. So those are called line breaks. Let me just check. Yeah. So I'm going to put it in the chat because I didn't put an example here, I don't think. So, oh, oops, changing this thing. I just checked oh. the element text. I think the size, I know, I know what you're talking about, the millimeters. I can't remember where that was, but I just checked the arguments. And I think the size for element text is 
they have it listed as PTS points. I'm not sure what that means. Oh, points. That's like, like um, like what word uses like twelve points, eleven points. That's it. Yeah, that's okay. that's what it is. <laughs> and then let that's me for check. element text. Yeah, uh, that's for element the font size controlled by the size. Is, oh, the font size. It's just the book talks about the millimeters. Yeah, it says the font size. So I think that's if you're doing GM so text. My understanding is this is using the what's the name? It's using a different package. It's not it's not just ggplot, right? It's um, well, I think it's for the GM text function. Yeah. Yeah. So in GG text, I think it's points. But if you're doing size in ggplot, then it's millimeters. No, I think it's the other way. So mm -hmm. the yeah, so when you say element text, um Colin is right. So element text uses points. But when we used and we're gonna see an example, geom text, that's a function for I mean ggplot's function, geom text. When you put size in there, it's in millimeters. I'll explain that in a little bit, but anyway, that's a good reminder that element text, every time you see size, so for example, this size nine. This is going to be the exact same size that you see in Word, like that 9, 10, 12, etc. That's in points. This is theme, actually. This is for chapter 17, but anyway, I am talking about themes right now. Um, so this is also super important because once we export the graphs, it's going to be tiny, tiny if we use 9. So anyway, there are ways to handle that. But anyway, so moving on. Just remember that we can insert line breaks so that we can separate text in different lines. The other thing that is super interesting is that if you want to have, instead of doing with here, if you want to have, for example, um, an equation or fx equals x squared or something like that, you can put any mathematical expression, and this is an e, it shouldn't be an a, sorry about that typo, inside quote. So then you say, for example, here, y equals, and then you put quote, and inside quote, you put the equation that you want. So that it, so that then you don't have like a, a word like with, et cetera, et cetera, but instead you have um, fx equals equals x, and then the little hat, two, for example, if it's going to be squared. So that's super interesting, and it doesn't go in quotes or anything. It's just um, quote the word, and then you put the expression that you want without putting it in single quotes or double quotes. It just goes exactly like you would have written it in R. And the other thing to remember, too, is that if you want to remove a label, so let's say you don't want with here, you for whatever reason, you want to remove that um, that act, that Y label or that y-axis label you can do it um by going here in labs and then say x equals and then just quotes or you can put null without putting it in quotes so that's gonna get rid of that label all right so now let's go to text labels and then the millimeters thing is gonna have it's going to make more sense now. I'm sorry I brought that up before. I should have um, I should have clarified that before. But anyway, so if we want to put, instead of points, we want a, a word instead of the point, then we use, because that's a geom, right? So then what we do is we use the function geom text. Geom text is part of ggplot. So we're not using any other packages here so far. So this is going to add a label text to the x and y coordinates of a graph so that instead of having a point, you're going to have a scatter plot, for example, scatter points. You're going to have scatter text, scatter words. You can change the font with the family aesthetic, and it works exactly like any other geom that we have seen. Um, there are two 
packages that are going to help us handle extra funds. The book doesn't go into too much detail into how to do this. I'm going to show you how I handle if I want to do extra funds or if I want to add another fund. I'm going to show that to you in a little bit. Um, because just ggplot accepts three funds, if I'm not mistaken. So if we want to change any of our funds in a graph, we have to do it in a different way. I'll show you how I do it in a little bit. Um, and you can have, obviously, bold, italic. All of that is controlled with face, um, which is going to be inside the element text um, or the uh, geom text, too. And then the uh, instead of the theme, it's going to be controlled in here in the geom text. You can also control the alignment. You can also control um, the angle if you want the text to be angled for whatever reason with angle. And you can also control the size of the text. But this is where it comes in millimeters instead of points. So whenever you have element text, that's in points. Size for geom text is in millimeters. So that's important to remember um, the distinction because we have to think of this as a geom, as a point, as a line, as a as a as a you know a geom instead of thinking of this as a label. Uh, yeah, Colin, to tell me. Yeah, so just to jump in, so we're talking kind of talking about this. There is some flexibility in geom text if you don't like it to default to millimeter. There is an argument mm -hmm. called size.unit, which you can change to points, centimeters, inches, or picas, picas. I'm not sure how to say that unit, but if you don't like to default to millimeter, there is a size.unit that can modify if you want to change how to reference the size of your text in geom text. Actually, that's a good reminder. Thank you for that, because we should actually check the... Um... Let me see if I can change what, what I'm sharing. Yes. So we should check here. Geom text. And then we're going to see that geom text understand all of these aesthetics, which is exactly where you are coming in, right? So it's going to accept X, Y. So whatever it is that you're feeding uh, to this geom, right? The label, blah, 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 and then it has the size. So for size, I think this is what you're talking about. Let me see if we can see an example here. Uh, it might not be in the examples, but if you go up to the no. parameter section, I think, or the yeah. arguments section of the docs, like if you scroll up, scroll up. So, uh, yep, Oops. so arguments, it should be listed size.unit. Yeah, how the size is. aesthetic is interpreted. So you can actually bypass that, which is by default is millimeters. I think that's what you're saying, right? So we can bypass that instead of millimeters to use point centimeters, inches, or picas, which I have never used. Um, but that's a good reminder. Thank you, um, Colin, for that. And yeah, these are all the arguments that the function accepts. So the mapping is all the aesthetics that I just mentioned. So now let's go back. Um, no, I don't remember where I am. I think it's this one. Yes, okay. So, okay, let's see some examples of text labels. So again, this is with geom text. So let's say we have this fictitious data frame, right? That it's gonna look like this. It's just some points for X, some points for Y. And then we're just including a, categorical variable here that's called face with plain bold or italic. So how does text look like? So first we create a ggplot where we feed this data that we just created and we're going to say that our aesthetics are x and y. That's what we want to, um, um, so it's going to be 1, 3, 1, 2, 1, 1, right? Like those are the, the coordinates that we want to map. And then we don't want a geom point, we don't want any of that, we want geom text. So what do we do? We start with the aesthetics and we say that the label that we want is going to be this column right here that has the text so that this can, instead of having the points, it's going to have those words. Um, and that the font face is going to be 
So this argument here is just so that it remembers, or not remembers, but that it uses this thing, plain, I want it false or I want it in italic. I am just controlling the way that the, um, that the text is gonna look like in terms of um, if I want it bold or not bold or italic, et cetera. So I'm not controlling it within, I'm controlling it inside a geom text. That's important to remember. And then we have the um, vertical adjustment and the horizontal adjustment where exactly I want it. If it's inward, if I want it left, if I want it um, right, et cetera, et cetera. Let me show you the, what that means here. So the alignment can be left, center, right, inward, or out, outward. And that is going to be for that point exactly where I want it and where that point is. So how the text in that, let's say, it doesn't have a little box, but if it was in a, if it were in a little box, how I want my, uh, my text look like. And then the size that I'm gonna use, again, this is in millimeters and the angle is gonna be a 10 degree angle, right? So all of these things I can control. And we already saw all the aesthetic that this can accept. So there are many, many more things that we can adjust. Let's see an example with more points. So here I'm just using the base graph that I did a couple of slides ago, but now what I want, instead of having all those points, what I want is the, numbers a label right instead of having um the uh, the point so for that what exactly do i want the label to be i want the body mass in grams so that column exactly is what i want it to appear instead of having points i control exactly the value that i want here and i can also use these other very useful argument from geom text that is called check overlap and if i set it to true what it's going to do is it's going to sort of like um jitter it a little bit so that there's no overlap between values but if there are too many points it can get a little messy because sometimes what it does is it deletes one of the labels and then there are other ways to handle that but um in general this should do the trick and this works. This check overlap equals true so that there are no two numbers or two labels on top of each other. Like this, for example. So this is another example with instead of having geom text, we are using geom label, which is exactly the same thing. The only difference is it's gonna have the label inside a little rectangle. And we can control many, many things here too. And look at the labels also, how they change. So here we have a little rectangle with rectangle. I never know how to say that word. Rectangle, rectangle. Anyway, the little box. And for um, for text, I think it, it's only gonna have the little, the little letter instead of having the box around it, which is not what we have here in this other example. But I, if I remember correctly, that's how the, um the legend looks like so anyway so here we have a bunch of overlapping labels but we have the labels nonetheless so um let's see another example here so we have with the data set mpg which is um the car the cars um the data set that it's already in r or is it ggplot i don't remember but anyway it's already there we're just controlling that we want, instead of having points again, we want the geom text and we want the models here um, as, uh, as the little labels. So the X and the Y is still controlled by the display on the highway. It's just what text I want it on top of that point. I hope that makes any sense. Um, okay, so then why do I put it twice? Oh, I don't know why I put it twice here. I think I just copied it. And then, okay, so this is how it looks like without checking the overlap. And this is how it looks like when you check the overlap. So essentially, look at this one, for example, at the top. 
it has like two little labels, one on top of the other. So it's new beetle and then Jada is on top of it. What this overlap is doing is it's removing one of the labels. Is this really what we want? Right? Or is this like, it depends on the data that you're doing. Um, for example, here be below this point that it's Ultima, maybe you have the same label over and over and over again, so then it wouldn't be a problem. But if you are losing labels here, then it could be a problem. Sometimes what it does is if it's two labels like this one, but the other one is going to be right nearby, so it just puts them one next to the other, but sometimes it removes them. So we have no control exactly of how the overlap works. So to counteract that effect or to avoid those problems, there's a package called GigiRepel or GigiRepel. I don't know how you say that. GigiRepel? I guess GigiRepel sounds better. Um, and what we do is inside this GigiRepel, we have a function called gm underscore text underscore repel. And that, when we just use, you know, we say exactly the same as with gm text, we just say, let's use a label here model, and then that takes care of the problem. So here you're going to see that the points are a little um, jittered, I think it's the word, right? Like they're a little bit moved, but they're going to be connected sometimes with a little line, just so that we don't forget where they're coming from. Um, and then, let me see, what am I doing here? Um, okay, so I think this is another example. Oh, now remember, so with GM label, sometimes we have like a very busy background. So if we were to put this peak two and peak one, sometimes it would get like this background is very, very busy. So it would get lost. So sometimes that's better to use this geom label so that the geom label will be inside one of those little boxes. But that's one of the things that this thing, when I needed it again, it's not showing. So anyway, Colin, you have a question. Uh, more of a comment. So if you go up to <laughs> the the one thing like the check overlap like the one thing i didn't un so like check overlap it basically yeah. says like it will it will um it will plot the labels or the or plot the text based on the order that those labels are in the data so like starting from well, mm -hmm. row one two three four five and then it will make that decision as it goes through that which was a little confusing to me at first until I read it, um, but I wanted to highlight that it's the order of your data that it makes it makes the decisions on what is overlapped. Um, that's not supported by genome labels, so you can't use it for that. And then I had another comment about ggrepl, which mm -hmm. I like ggrepl. I've used it quite a bit. The only thing that I don't like about it is like if you, I think you have to set the seed or set the randomizer or else every time that you render the plot, it's going to change the oh, position yes. of the labels, which is really so set, aggravating. <laughs> yes. So you set the seed, and that's actually a very good example um, of why I, well, anyway, I have just one example of when I use this text, when I have so many points. I think that's also part of the discussion. I just, it's already 12.30, but so if you set the seed here, let's say set seed 17, then that's going to ensure that every time you render this plot, it's going to look exactly like this. And it's not because it's randomized. You're right. This is a randomized thing. Um, so it's not going to change the way the points are, are, are organized or which labels are the ones that are being shown. That's a good point. So always set that seed here, and I didn't put that here, but that's a that's actually a very good comment. Um, so for me in my practice and the way that I, you know, the data analysis that I do, I, to be honest with you, I rarely, rarely do these kinds of graphs 
I do do the ones that have a line and then I can put a little bowl on it. Yes, but I use a specific package for that. However, the only time that I think this can be useful for me in my data analysis is when I'm doing uh, multivariate statistics. So if I'm doing a PCA, or if I'm, which is the most common example, if I'm doing a PCA, for example, uh, our NMDA uh, analysis too, where I have like this biplots, when I have two or three dimension, and then I want to know exactly the value of each one of my points because it's it's a cloud of points, then this becomes super helpful because then I can control exactly what I see there. But other than that, I never, I rarely use gene text or gene labels, but I don't know if you guys have any other example or any other, you know, use for these guys. Sometimes when you have something like this, this makes a little bit more sense, but it's rarely this when you have the cloud of points, like I, I rarely do. This, I see it more useful. Kaya, you have an example? Yeah, the only time that I've used this is kind of using it as a little bit of a hack. Like I'll just set most of the rows to NA in the text column and then only keep the ones that I actually want to label because I, I much more frequently want to label just a few points. And that's pretty hard to do without like, you know, explicitly setting the position of each one. And I don't want to, yeah. you know, it's, it's a pain. So if I need to label like 10 points, I'll just, you know, make a column that has no data for all the rest. And then I use it that way. I love that idea. I love that idea. You're right. So if you have your data frame and you add a column that's called label, and then the points that you don't care about are NA, 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 and then the only ones that you do want to label for, you put there the label, right? Like whatever it is that you want. And then you put that inside the... Um, so the aesthetics here, label equals label, right? So that the only thing that's going to show is going to be those labels. I think that's a great hack. That I really like good with it too is that you can do it conditionally um, and programmatically. So you can say, you know, you can use like case when or some other conditional logic to only fill in the label if the value is less than four or, you know, whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or something, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's also good. Yes, I like that. All right, so let's go to GM label. So like I said, GM label draws a rounded rectangle behind the text. So it's gonna be exactly the same label, except that it's gonna be inside this little rectangle. So sometimes for aesthetic reasons, you know, it highlights the information. So it's a little better than just having the text that may get lost in the cloud of points or something like that. This is a personal preference. I don't think there's like a like a, a specific guide for that, except that if you have a very busy background, like the one we saw here, this gets lost. But if you put a label on top of it, like I thought I had an example here, but if you have a busy background like that one and you put this GM label instead of GM text, then it's gonna highlight a lot, right? It's gonna look a little more Prominent, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and then, yeah, with GM REPL, which is exactly what we were talking about before, then here's going to be an example of how this GM label, which works exactly like GM text with the same aesthetics and the same way. So we are here just um, using the MPG uh, database here or data set here. And then we only have. Um, which is a little bit of what you were talking about right now, Kaya, but we only want a few points instead of having all of them, right? So what we did here is we did this mini MPG data set, which is we're just extracting a sample of 20 points from this MPG. We are like subsetting um, these rows. So that's what we're feeding here into the GM label. And then we're saying that the that we want to see, the text that we want to see, is from the, uh, the the label that we want to see, right? It's from the column called class. 
So that's what we are seeing here. If we do, again, um, if we check here, there are so many overlaps on top of each other, right? We don't necessarily want that. So by doing um, the geom REPL, and I put here um, the full package with the function, then we can sort of avoid that a little bit, right? Like So then we don't have necessarily overlaps on top of our, um, like this one right here, pickup, pickup. So we just have one pickup. Um, okay. So then, so they work exactly the same. It, it, actually, when you look for geom text in the health function, you will get the geom label too. You you will get them. Both. You will get both. Of them. Okay. So if we go to annotations, uh, or if we look at another section called annotations, what am I talking about here? So annotations are gonna be. And let me just have it here so that I don't remember. Okay. So the geom text and the geom label functions are just going to add text as what we just saw before. Geom rect, what it's going to do, is going to highlight interesting rectangular regions of the plot. Then when we see geom line, geom path, or geom segment, what it's going to do is it's going to add lines. Some of those lines can be curved. Some of those lines can be just straight line. And it has a bunch of arguments inside so that we can control the angle and et cetera, et cetera. And additionally, if we want to add an arrow to any of this uh, different geom line path or segment, we can add to the, we can add arrow heads to the beginning or to the end or both of them um, using just the, uh, the geom called arrow. And that is going to control, you know, the type of, arrowhead that we want in addition to the line or in addition to the curved line. So if we there's not geom arrow, let's say. You have to have the geom line and the arrow. And we're going to see an example if I'm not mistaken here. Then we have uh, geom V line, geom H line, and geom AV line. That's going to add just um, lines on top of the um, uh, reference lines. For example, if you want to just reference, for example, zero, and this is like where the zero is in my x-axis, then you use like a geom um, V line, right? Like a vertical line. And if, or if you want to do that horizontally, you use H line. And then um, we have annotate, which can be used in combination with arrow. And we're going to see a little example of that. So starting with the base plot that we started with at the beginning, and if we then use the annotate, we can then add exactly the label that we want. So this is how we write custom labels or custom annotation in our plot instead of using the information from a data frame or from a table or from something like that. So what we do is we use this function called annotate, which is also part of ggplot. It starts with the argument geom, and we have to <coughs> indicate that it is text. We're not going to use, um, so what we're going to input here is going to be text. Then we have to, and this is this is the cumbersome part, but we have to do it. We have to exactly say what are the coordinates that I want to use? What's my X and what's my Y? Sometimes this is where it needs a little tweaking, and then you don't want 42, you want 43, and you don't want 20, you want you better want, um, or you'd rather have 18 or something, right? Like that takes a little tweaking. And then you put in the argument label exactly the text type that you want it to appear here inside quotes. And again, this can take, um, you know, markdown text too. And then size is going to be, again, in millimeters. So you're going to control um, the size of this. You can control the color. There are all kinds of arguments that you can control here too for your custom annotation. If you want to add an arrow, what you do is you add again with annotate, but instead of saying text, what I want is a curve line. So you specify with specifying the geom curve, you have to specify the x and the y, but you also have to specify when where the x ends 
and where the why ends. Because these are just going to be the starting points. And this is what takes a little bit of time learning about annotate. Because the X and the Y is going to control just where those lines start. But where do they end? You also have to put those coordinates, right? You can specify the curvature, how curved you want your line to be. That also takes a little bit of tweaking. There is no like magic formula here that I can give you. The size of the line that you are going to get. So this is the thickness of the line, if I'm not mistaken. And then the arrow. What type of arrow do you want? And how long is that arrow going to be, like the arrowhead specifically? So that what goes in here. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I am moving this so annoyingly. Okay. And then let's see that example. So that's going to be like this guy right here. Right? This is exactly what we're talking about with the first one. And then, um, so that's the curve. Then you can also add text. And it is going to be the this part right here, the average chin strap, with exactly the way that I just showed you before. Then the average adult is here. You have another annotate. And if, if you want this average gen 2, this is another annotate too. The line here, again, is the curve, right? So this is going to have to have each one of these lines is a different annotate. So for each one of my labels here, I have to create a line too. Let me see the chat. Oh my God, yeah, Kaya, forget it. Oh, forget it. And let me show you another package in a little bit that is not in the book, but I'm gonna show you another package. No, this is, forget it, 10 hours, just doing one plot, and then you're not even done just with the arrows, right? No, forget it, this is ridiculous. But yeah, that's me too. Um, this is where I procrastinate and where I lose all my time. But anyway. Super cool, super interesting, right? And then let me see if we have another example. Yeah, so you can get as crazy as you want. There is, for all of this, I think it's in the um, it's in the book too, not just in the notes. Um, but so the only caveat that I want to mention here, I don't know if you guys have any opinions on this, is that the all of these tools are super useful. Things can get crazy fast. So, do you really need those labels? Could you explain that in the text if you're doing like a paper or something like that? A manuscript? Do you really need all those labels? Is it going to add too much clutter to your graph? That's something that you need to figure out for yourself, right? Because things can get crazy real fast. Okay. So, before we move on, I just want to show you. Let me see if I can. Do you see my new? Um, are you, are we still on the on the on the um, on the notes, or are you seeing what see, I'm typing right now? Yeah, we see your okay. Uh, so let me see if I have them here. Uh, so I was doing. Um, can I access this actually? Uh, why not? I can do it in my phone. Okay, let me see if I can do it here. So there is this other package. Oh my God, I'm so sorry about this. This looks horrendous. But there is, this is my website. I'm so sorry for this. Um, why can't I do this? I wish I could just pick this. I thought I could. But anyway, there is this very cool package. Let me just go to my GitHub then. And let's go to my repository. And then if we go to my tidy Tuesday contributions, um, you're going to see here, but maybe that's going to be better. I don't know which one was that one. Is it this one? Yes. So this is a very cool package, and I'll show you in a little bit, where what it does is it adds these labels 
on top of your lines, which ends up looking super, super aesthetically pleasing. And I have the code here. If anybody's interested, I can put the um, I can put it in the chat. Um, because the package is called Geom Text Path. It's this one right here, Geom Text Path. So the way you do it is here with this, I think it is with this Geom Text line. So that's the function that I did to create the, the little, um, the little lines with the little annotations or with the little labels. If I'm not mistaken, it's that one, the one I used. But anyway, I have all the code because I already did that plot many months ago, so I don't really remember. But this GM text path is super cool and super useful. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that, so the book talks a little bit about what fonts you can use um, with, if I'm not mistaken, let me see, because the book talks about this, that you only have access to like three fonts, which are, yeah, to so like very simple sans, serif, or mono. And those are like the basic fonts that you can use. So let me see with my waffle plot. I think it's this one is better. The way I add and I recommend working with fonts is using font at Google. You just have to make sure that this, whatever it is that you add here, it has to be installed in your machine. So you just go to Google fonts and then make sure to download this Poppins one. If that's the one you want, if you want new font 24 17, you add that one, it doesn't matter. Just make sure that the, the way that it's named as you installed it, that's the name that has to be here. So that's the way I use this CIS fonts. That's the pack that I recommend when you're working with, uh, with other fonts that are not necessarily the ones that are with ggplot. And I think that then I control it more on your text. I'm sorry? Screen. Could you just zoom in a little bit more? Yes, I'm so sorry. It's a bit small. That's good. Yeah, thanks. I'm so sorry. So, but I can give you the link to my GitHub also so that you can check it. But it's this package, this font. The yeah. function is font cool. at Google. And then what you want to do is in the theme of whatever plot that you have, let's say that this is going to be the plot title that you want with a different um, family or the different font in the element text, you just change it here in family. But you have to make sure that you did these two parts before the sys fonts and then the show text auto. So that takes a little bit used to it. We can go through that some other time because now it's almost time. But those are the ways that I recommend uh, to handle extra fonts. Oh my goodness, sorry about that. Extra fonts here in whatever plot that you're doing. That can work here with annotations too, of course, because um, here, I think if I'm not mistaken, inside annotate, let's just actually, let's check. Um, there should have a family font. Um, annotate. It should have a family, Ooh, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't. I'm not sure if, if it will work with annotate, but it would work with um, with whatever text you have around it. That I can 100% um, confirm. Okay, and then moving on from all of that, sorry, it's a lot of information here, just to finish up. Um, so direct labels package. So this is another package that's available um, so that we can work with ggplot in order to place labels closer to the data than legends. So how does this work? And we're also going to use, so we're going to use these functions, ggforce and gghighlight. Okay, so 
this is um, okay. So this is an example. This is what it's gonna look like. So it's kind of like the one the one I just just showed you. I think my example looks much aesthetically pleasing than this one, but it's the same thing, right? Like the only difference is that this is a, a box, a label. The other one is sort of incorporated in the in the line, so so to speak. Um, so the way we do this is with here. So inside, uh, not inside, like one of the other arguments, you have your beautiful graph already set. So now what you do is you use GG highlight, and then what you put inside that GG highlight is gonna be whatever it is that you wanna sort of the text that you want to highlight here. Um, and the other thing that this thing is talking about here is GG4s. So let me see here. Oh, that example is not here. Boop. Okay. Yeah, I will send you, um, I'll put it in the Slack, the um, the link to my GitHub. Sorry, you guys, I can't, sometimes I can't do two things at the same time. Okay, and then let's see another example of these GG highlights because this is gonna be um, for here. So remember that the thing that we're doing here with state is it's it's one of the columns, right? So So this is using information or from the data frame that you have, I hope I'm, I'm explaining this correctly. So you already have a column here um, that you're saying each state, right? That that's gonna be controlled like the color of each state, but state is gonna be one of your columns. So you're saying each state is gonna have a different color, but because you filtered it before, you're just saying, these are the ones that I want to have colored. Anyway, I'm so over explaining here, I think. So then with that same column, these are the ones that I want to see highlighted or the ones that I just want to see the label for. So this is how you do that. This is how this works. So I only want the, high, the label for Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa. I don't care about the other lines, which is why they are like in the background. Okay. Another example of highlighting is with uh, with facet wrap. So here, what it's doing is um, so you're going to have all the points here in each one of your facets. You're going to have, even though you said that you want the facet wrap for species, it's highlighting the specific species for that. Uh, for this facet, but it's also gonna show the other species sort of muted in the background. So when you do the regular facet wrap, you only have, in this case, the red points, right? The ones that correspond to that facet. But with GG Highlight, what it does is it's gonna show everything, but just those highlighted. So this is super useful many, many times so that it becomes super useful when you're comparing using facet wrap. I love these little um this little thing. I didn't know before, so I learned it by reading this chapter, which it's a super, super example, super great example actually. And then here, the other thing that this is doing is with uh ggtext and it's just using a function called geom reach text. And then what it does is you can use um html code to modify whatever label you want so then here you can you can see here that it's gonna be um geom textbook let me see if this one has it yeah so here um so it's using for example not just markdown coding but you can also use html um tags to modify not to modify, but to um, to write whatever text you have here. But for that, you have to use these geom text bots, right? Or the geom rich text, or um, these geom text box right here. 
So you, the way you do this is, or the way that is recommended is, you write the vector with all your text, with all the HTML, blah, blah, blah. And then you put that in the label of the geom text box or the label of the geom rich text, which in this case it's using, this is just for the, for the little star that's right here. Um, so I think those are super, super cool examples too of how to include and modify text inside one of your, um, one of your plots. So I see, so that's one for examples. Yeah, so for these things, I see uh, this is super useful, more than the geom text and geom label that we were seeing before. I see more use out of that. Um, faceting annotation, this is also, I think this is the last part. So then we have here facet wrap. Again, we are doing, you know, the different facets. But what we're saying here is that by saying the scales, this free X thing, um, let me see what it's 2000 here. Yeah, so now, huh. Oh, I think it's because the way the data is this thing right here, because it's filtered so many times. I think that this, what it's doing is by setting the free X scales, it's just saying, I just want the label for that specific facet wrap. But I, but to do that, I had filtered it before here, um, this GG highlight. I, so it's the, um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so, so you have the Gigi highlight here before. So you have this graph, but if you don't want it like this, you want it in facet, you just add the facet wrap on scales free X so that it's going to just highlight that specific label, but you had already sort of, um, filtered it like that with Gigi Highlight, et cetera. I think that's what it's doing. Um, the other way that I've seen these scales or the three scales is that if you don't want this to start, for example, from 2000, this goes from 2000, 2020. So if you set here scales equals free X, that means that for Minnesota, this, let's say it doesn't start in 2000, it starts in 2010. And it goes all the way to 2020. So that's another way that you can use scales, free scales here. Um, and then this one, I think that this one, which is um, with the grid package, what it's doing is it's just grabbing. I, I think that this, this is very poorly explained here. I'm just going to, um quickly mention this that you can grab specific parts of a plot those are called grubs so you can grab legends or um the title or something like that you can grab, grab those grubs and then move them around and combine it with other plots or something like that so i think that that this is exactly what this is doing um with grub tree you're robbing or grabbing this text, which it's called Great Recession, you have that label there. And then you're just saying that I want it included in my facets too. I think that this needs a larger explanation. So let's just avoid this right now. And we're going to talk about grubs in another, I think a little bit in another chapter, because this is just a little too much for just this little mini example. And then that's it, you guys. This ends with a few resources that you can check. And like I said, I'm going to put my uh, GitHub in the Slack so that you guys can have access to those other plots that I did. And that's it. That's it. Anybody has any comments or any things that you want to say? Which I love all the comments and interjections that you guys always do. Um, no, I... Uh... I haven't used annotations very much, so I'm excited to have learned a bunch. 
Yeah, I don't I don't have much to add. I, you already covered what I was going to say about the free X and free Y. I usually use that in situations where the range is different and you just want to like allow those different facets to have the range. Um, no, I think I think I think you did an excellent job covering annotations. Um, and there are some good tidbits in there that I'm definitely going to take away. So, yeah, I think like I said, those points right not you really useful, but the final parts, custom annotations, the direct labels package, the faceting annotations, and the thing that I showed you. Um, yeah, I think those are super useful. Okay, so with that being said. I'm sorry that I wasn't too active with the chat, but I am very bad at lots of things at the same time. So I'm going to put stop in the chat, and then I'll see you guys next week. All right. Bye, you guys.